Well, good morning, Heartland. Happy August long weekend to you. I hope you guys are having a a great summer. Uh, It's good to be back. I was spending some time in Saskatchewan in July, just enjoying some days on the lake and uh, pulling my kids around on a tube. I love to hear them scream. (laughs) So that's just fun. Uh, But at the end of my holidays, last weekend on Sunday, uh, I had the opportunity to be a part of a backyard baptism. A couple from our church here, Corey and Gabby, uh, decided to get baptized in their pool. <clears throat> so it was really cool just to hear their stories about what Jesus is doing in their lives and to be part of their baptism to celebrate with them and just the work of transformation that's been going on. So there's just a few pictures there, what we did last Sunday. So that was really neat. Well, it's, again, it's good to gather on this long weekend. And uh, if you're joining us online, just want to say glad that you are also spending part of your weekend with us too. I was a child of the 90s, so grew up in the 90s, and that was kind of before the days of smartphones and being on devices, we we entertained ourselves with other things. And one of the things I remember in the 90s was this optical illusion art called Magic Eye. Does anybody remember that? (laughs) Yeah, like it it was huge, right? It took over the world for a brief period of time in the 90s. And uh, in case you have no idea what what it is, uh, there's a picture of it there on the screen. That's what it looks like. So on the surface, it just looks like an absolute mess. But if you look at it just right, there is a a hidden 3D image in the picture. And and I used to get so frustrated because I, I could never see it. I could never find the hidden image in these pictures. And I would just stare for hours blankly at these pictures, convinced there is nothing there to see. Until finally a friend, he helped me out. He told me how he does it, and he showed me a trick to doing it. And so you might be actually sitting too far away for this to work, for you to be able to to see it. But the way that you do it is you need to diverge your eyes in such a way that you split the image into two. And so if you hold your finger in front of your face about six inches away, and if you look at it with both eyes, you see one finger. But if you look past your finger, beyond your finger, you should see your finger split into two. And that's what you need to do with this picture in order to see the image. You need to split it into two, and then you need to hold it there long enough You need to set your eyes there long enough, and then a 3D image begins to form, is finally revealed. And so after my friend showed that to me, I could finally see what was there all along that was in front of me the entire time. So can anybody see what it is? No. Frustrating, right? (laughs) It's actually a dolphin that's jumping through a hoop. Yeah, I know. What? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, you can come and talk to me after if you're frustrated by that. I know, I was frustrated. I can show you later. It's fine. <clears throat> but it made me think of this idea that there are often things in our life that we're blind to. Things that we can't see that are right in front of us. But we actually need someone else to help us see and understand what we can't see on our own. This summer, we're in a series on the Holy Spirit, and this is something that the Holy Spirit does. The Bible says that the enemy has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the truth. And so part of the role of the Holy Spirit is the work of illumination, to bring the truth to light, to open our eyes and enable us to see and recognize truth. So if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. That'll be our main text for today. Chapter 2, we're going to read from verse 6 and go all the way to verse 16. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away... But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 
these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. One of the things I find interesting is that we live in a culture that is largely opposed to Jesus. But not necessarily opposed to spirituality. In fact, I think we live in a culture that is quite open to spirituality. I read in a study that about 7 out of 10 adults consider themselves to be spiritual in some way because they think of themselves as spiritual people or they say spirituality is very important in their lives. But what's also interesting to me is that what it means to be spiritual, according to the world, has developed and expanded over time. That what it means to live a spiritual life has gotten so watered down that for many people, being spiritual has nothing to do with God or Jesus. There was a truck commercial a few years ago that starts out with a guy in a deep voice. You know the the deep voice truck guy? (laughs) The Ford F-150. Yeah, it's that guy. So it starts out with a guy in, in the deep voice saying that a truck is a spiritual kind of thing. And he goes on to talk about the special meaning that owning a truck will bring to your life. Who owns a truck? <laughs> few people. It's fine. You can, it's, it's all good. But spirituality is no longer, according to the world, a distinctly Christian experience. Dallas Willard said this. He said, I believe that spirituality is the arena in which specifically Christian faith and practice will have to struggle desperately in the coming years to retain integrity. We live in a world that practices a spirituality without God. And I wonder if the reason why people are open to spirituality is because they want to feel some sense of enlightenment. That deep down, they know there must be something more than just the natural world around us. That there is a higher purpose. There's a deeper meaning to life, and they're searching for it. See, the world seeks an experience with the divine, but God offers us a relationship with the divine. And in this passage, Paul is contrasting the wisdom or the spirit of the world with the wisdom and the Spirit of God. And he reminds us in verse 12 that we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. And when Paul talks about the Spirit of the world, it represents worldly human wisdom and understanding. It's the natural human mindset influenced by worldly values and philosophies. It represents the human way of thinking which is often limited to a secular and materialistic perspective. It represents the prevailing cultural, social, and moral values that are not aligned with God's principles. It represents the collective mindset and attitudes of society that are often at odds with God's truth. And this spirit stands in opposition to the divine wisdom imparted by the Holy Spirit. It is characterized by reliance on human intellect and reasoning rather than on divine revelation and spiritual insight. And when Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth, 
The Christians there were under opposition and pressure to conform to a worldly way of thinking. You see, Corinth was a city in Greece, and the Greeks were big on philosophy. They were big on thinking. They were big on wisdom. They looked to Greek philosophers like Socrates and Aristotle and Plato for human wisdom. And being in that culture, it was really easy for them just to slip back into that mold, to operate according to worldly wisdom. And Paul is reminding them that that you did not receive the wisdom and the spirit of the world, but you have received the wisdom and the spirit of God. Earlier on in this chapter, in verses 1 to 5, Paul reminded them about this. He said, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. God did not give us the Holy Spirit so that we can continue conforming to the pattern of this world. Pressed into the mold of the way the world tells you to think. But we're called to live according to the Spirit. And what Paul is telling the church at Corinth, and what I think the reminder is for every follower of Christ is that at all times we are either being formed by the wisdom and the spirit of this world or we're being formed by the wisdom and the spirit of God. And Paul is saying that when it comes to finding wisdom, that it's not about what you know. It's about who you know. It's not about what you know, but it's about who you know. The Holy Spirit. See, when it comes to the things in your life that you're uncertain about, when you don't have an answer, when you need wisdom, when you need help, when you're walking through a dark valley, when you feel paralyzed about making a tough decision, when you don't know what to do, you have a helper you can call upon. His name is the Holy Spirit, sent by God, and he is here to help you. And all we have to do is ask James chapter 1 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. As followers of Jesus, we have access to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's come to give us wisdom that goes beyond human reason or understanding. So if you lack wisdom, ask the Holy Spirit. You know, I I think in our culture, we just get so used to jumping on Google or saying, hey, Alexa, or hey, Siri. We look to the experts, or or maybe we ask our parents for advice or wisdom. And I'm not saying any of that is wrong or sinful. We, We actually need community in our life, and we need others to walk with us and to speak into our lives. But do we just get so used to that worldly way of finding wisdom that we don't make asking the Holy Spirit a regular pattern in our every day? Do we really believe that the Holy Spirit is the ultimate source of wisdom in our lives? So if you lack wisdom, ask the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on to talk about how the wisdom of God, how this wisdom from the Spirit is something the world does not understand or accept. He says in verse 14 that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In the Greek, the natural person refers to the psyche of a person. It refers to a materialist who lives life as if there was nothing beyond this physical life. And on a level maybe we can all understand, it's, it's kind of the life that an animal lives. You know, think about your dog if you have one. I hate to break it to you, but I don't believe your dog has a spiritual life. Some of you might think your dog is saved. 
and that they pray right along with you. Maybe you've taught them to fold their paws. But just telling you the truth in love, I don't believe your dog has a spiritual life. Because when you talk about the kind of life that an animal lives, they are only concerned with material things. A place to sleep, a place to scratch, food, water to drink. There is no spiritual life. And this is the level where we all start life. The life that is inherited from Adam is the natural life. This is how we are all born. And we all have to live in and deal with the material world, don't we? There is nothing inherently sinful about natural life. God is not displeased when you have to eat, when you have to sleep, when you have to work. He's not up there in heaven looking down on us saying, oh, there they are sleeping again. Every night they do that. I'm so frustrated. If only they were more spiritual. God is not opposed to this material life that we have to live. He created us so that we have to interact with this material world. We are subject to the physical realities of this world. But life on this level, lived only on this level, is without spiritual insight. The natural person does not accept the things of God. Spiritual things seem foolish to the natural person. The natural person thinks, why would I waste my time going to church when I can be out having fun or sleeping in? And what's more, the natural person can't understand the things of God even if they wanted to because they are spiritually discerned. And it would be wrong for us to expect them to be able to see and value spiritual things. They are spiritually dead. Just like you wouldn't expect a corpse to be able to see the material world because a dead body can't see, someone who is dead spiritually can't see. And unless the Holy Spirit does a revealing work in the heart and in the mind of the natural person, they won't believe. For the natural person to come to a knowledge of the truth, the Holy Spirit has to do a work in them. And some of us can think of the natural people in our life. Some of us have friends or family, and this is where they're at. This is the life that they live. And maybe they think what you're doing here is foolish or that you're wasting your time. And, and some of us might also just be really burdened by the people in our lives that we desperately want to come to a knowledge of the truth. Some of them are close friends or close family, and they don't have a relationship with Jesus, and you're really burdened by that. But I, I think this is an encouragement for us to pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal truth in their lives. See, we can't argue someone into the kingdom of God. Sometimes maybe we get into debates, and we, and we think if we just reason good enough, or if we give them the right book, if we have the right answers, that we can convince them on our own, that we can argue them into the kingdom but what this is telling us is that there's a work, there's a piece of this that only the Holy Spirit can do. And don't hear me wrong, I, I do think there is a place for spiritual conversation, for being a, a good witness, to always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have. But we can't argue someone into the kingdom. And instead of trying to argue more, perhaps what we need to do is pray more pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal truth to them. This means that when you see a person beginning to gain some spiritual understanding, that when they begin to open up their hearts to the things of God, that it means that the Holy Spirit is doing a work in them. They're beginning to see the truth that's been in front of them all along. And this is referred to as the Holy Spirit's work of illumination. In verse 10, Paul says, these things God has revealed to us through what? Through hard work and study? Through those who have a PhD? Through intuition? Through discovery? God has revealed these things through the Spirit. 
Illumination is a work that the Holy Spirit does in drawing people toward a saving knowledge of the truth. It's the Holy Spirit that points the lost person toward the truth of the gospel. The Holy Spirit illuminates the mind and the heart of people. And for everyone who has come to faith in Jesus, for each of us, there there was a moment where the Holy Spirit turned the light on in our heart and in our mind, and we were able to recognize the truth. Salvation is a work of God. And so you might think, well then, if salvation is a work of God, then what is my part? Do we just sit back and do nothing and let the Holy Spirit just do the work that he does? Not at all. See, part of God's plan to bring people to a knowledge of the truth is through his church. That the Holy Spirit does a work of illumination, but Jesus also tells us this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Did you catch that last phrase? Let your light shine before others so that they may see. Let your light shine so they may see. See, this world we live in is a dark world. And the Bible says that the enemy has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the truth. But Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And I I just want to take a second and and just show you something. We did this the last two services, and I think it worked relatively well. Uh, If it doesn't work so well this time, we'll just pretend like it did as we go home. Uh, But uh, if you guys could just turn the lights, we're going to dim the lights down to pretty dark in here. Just for a moment. Marco. (laughs) So this is the world that we live in. It's a dark world. And this is what the natural person sees. They're in darkness. But it only takes a little bit of light to pierce the darkness. But you see, my light by itself can only do so much. And that's the beauty of the church. So if you have a light, why don't you pull that out as well? (laughs) And so now you can see all of our lights together, how much we can light up this dark room. So imagine what happens when every believer, when every believer filled with the Holy Spirit is shining the light of Christ in a dark world. Look what we do together. All right, thank you. I really like this quote from John Stott. He said this, what we need is not more learning, not more eloquence, not more persuasion, not more organization, but more power from the Holy Spirit. So as we close, I just want to give us an opportunity to consider a few questions for a time of just listening prayer. First off, perhaps you need to ask God for wisdom about something. Maybe you lack wisdom for a tough decision Maybe something regarding a a relationship, maybe something financial, something with a career. I don't know. But whatever that is, the first question, Holy Spirit, give me wisdom for. Give me wisdom for, and then fill in the blank. Secondly, perhaps there is someone that the Holy Spirit is putting on your mind to pray for. A friend or, or a family member who doesn't know Jesus. You can ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of Jesus to that person. Or maybe you're not a Christ follower and you're here and maybe all this sounds like a bit of foolishness to you. You're not sure, but you want to know. You can pray and ask the Holy Spirit for revelation, that that he would reveal the truth of Jesus to you. 
And it can be a real honest prayer just to say, God, I don't know if you're real. I'm not sure about any of this. But if you are, would you show me? Would you reveal yourself to me? That's the second question. Holy Spirit, reveal yourself too. And then you can fill in the blank. And then third, where are the places in my life where I need to shine the light of Christ to be a light in a dark place? And are there things in my life that are hindering me from doing that? So that's the third question. Holy Spirit, show me where I need to be a light. We'll take a few moments to reflect on that. Scott will play quietly, and then after a little bit, he'll lead us in a song. But as we step into that, let's just pray together. So Lord Jesus, as we take these moments to listen to your spirit, I pray that you would help us to block out all the external or internal noise that might be vying for our attention and that you would speak clearly to us, that we would hear your voice. We thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.